Radius Gallery's 8th Annual Holiday Show is now on display until the new year. With over 600 artworks featuring a massive array of eye-popping and affordable pieces. This is the most anticipated show of the year and is a wonderful opportunity for collectors and gift givers alike. Radius's largest holiday show yet, this year's exhibit features works by more than 150 artists, most of whom hail from Montana and about half from right here in Missoula. Two of these local artists, Pamela Cully from Hamilton and Theo Ellsworth from Missoula, have come together to give us an insight into how the elements of line inform their work. Hi everybody, this is Pamela Coey and this is uh, Theo Ellsworth. We are two very happy artists that have our work included in the holiday show at Radius Gallery in Missoula, Montana. And we are just going to be discussing our work in a very casual way. We both have slides showing the various uh, types of work we do. And we thought we would just chat informally about it. And um, Theo, do you wanna say any few words before I move over to the PowerPoint presentation? Um, let's see, I, I'm kind of a, I guess a multi-disciplinary artist, but every, everything I do revolves around drawing. Um, that's kind of the root of everything I do, but I, I, I make comics and I make fine art and uh, album art. Um, so I, I make my living kind of doing a patchwork of all kinds of things for all kinds of people. That's actually really, really important. Um, so Theo's a full-time artist and I am as well. Uh, our work is very different as you're going to see, but one reason why we're doing this together is because we're both very much uh, using line in our work. And so you'll see that very much in Theo's work. And then uh, I work in four different mediums uh, for those of you who know me. I'd say that I work a lot in acrylic and I love encaustic. And most of my encaustic work is what Radius Gallery shows of my work, but they have shown my acrylics as well. And then I also work in oil and cold wax medium. And in all of those mediums, I love line. So that's what we hope to kind of show you in the presentation is our love of line. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. So um, Theo's work is on the bottom and you can see that he has so much beautiful, intricate detail. And then my image, uh, one of my images is on top. So this is a chat about lines, marks and inspiration. Starting with you, Theo, tell us about this. Um, that's, well, I, uh, kind of my most uh, consistent um, illustration job is mm -hmm. I'm the house artist for a London-based record label called Astral Industries, right. um, which is all um, mostly European, um, kind of minimalist electronic music. Um, so it's all really like, uh, it's great music to draw, draw to. It's very uh, kind of trance inducing and relaxing. Nice. Um, and this is, this is one of the album covers I did for them. Um, and this is kind of a rare example of uh, some of my art with no figures in it of any kind. Right. That was the, the musician that specifically said he didn't want any um, figurative elements to it, um, which kind of like sent me down a, different kind of rabbit hole, I guess, from what I usually do. Right. I just really focused on the intense color and kind of the vibrating lines and everything. Uh, and so I'm curious, uh, like, how did you, how did you um, get to know Astral Industries? How did you, did they reach out to you? Did you reach out to them? How did you make this uh, collaboration? Um, they, they reached out to me. Um, I've, I had done a, a couple of album covers. Um, Kind of the most uh, famous one. I, I did a um, album cover for a musician uh, called Flying Lotus, um, and uh, who's on a pretty big label. Uh, he's a really amazing guy. Um, they so the, the the guy who was starting this label saw that cover and told me he was starting a record label that um, would only be releasing vinyl, and he asked me if I would be the artist to do all the covers. Oh my. Um, 
So I'm, I'm working on the 29th uh, album cover for them right now, actually. Yes. So I've been doing it for a little while. Um, like, so they, they send me the music and I'll just play it on repeat. And I'll just see what kind of images wow. come to mind in my head while I'm listening to it. Right. Um, but I also, uh, you know, will see if there's any notes from the mu- musicians about what they're, they're thinking. Um, and I also take a lot of cues from like the song titles and stuff like that too. And just try to come up with something that feels satisfying. So was this one different in that they said, you know, no figures, but is that something that, that that's true for all of their covers or just this one? Uh, just this one. Usually there's some kind of figure development. Right. Yeah, like the, the next slide actually has another one of the covers that I did for them. Okay, that, great. Um, that ended up having a, a figure in it. Um, and, the, and lots of, with this one, a lot of the song titles had to do with books. Um, and I, I love books and my library is kind of one of my, my, my prized possession. Um, right. So I really, I really had fun creating this kind of cosmic library. Um, most of the art for astral industry that has some kind of cosmic or space kind of quality right. to it. Like that. It's just, uh, it's just so creative. Um, I mean, to be inside of your mind <laughs> must be pretty amazing because uh, <laughs> yeah. The more I looked at your work, it, and I have one of your pieces, by the way, it's in my studio and I love it. Um, oh, yeah, I, I just, uh, and, and also what I really appreciate about your work, because it is so different from mine, is that you obviously have a boatload of patience and the ability to really dial in on details and, you know, you've got perspective and repetition and pattern and design and all these wonderful things. And it's just so intriguing to look at. I mean. Yeah. I Do you do like rough drafts for your work or is it just like you sit down and you just do it? Um, it for me, it always has to be right on the right on the page or whatever I'm working on. I'm, I'm not really good at, um, you know, drawing a preliminary sketch or anything like I once I start drawing, I just kind of get pulled in. Yeah. So I can't help but make it a finished drawing of some kind. So, <laughs> so yeah, with this, I mean, I just listen to the music and I would just start seeing what imagery came to mind and just start drawing. Um, and this is what came out of this one. <laughs> and and what, yeah, size, and what size are most of your drawings for this uh, label, the same size pretty much or. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're, um, you know, printed on, they, they become a, a, a 12 by 12 album. I see. Right. Um, so I, and I also do like the label on the vinyl and sometimes there's inserts and stuff. Uh-huh. Um, and then the back, the back covers are an ongoing, uh, like kind of cosmic space adventure comic that I've been drawing. Oh my goodness. So I, I make, you make each back cover kind of stands on its own, but if you put them all together, they sort of form a bigger story. Wow. That's really um, So, so the originals of these are all 12 by 12. And then they have the originals or do you get to keep them or how does that work? Um, I have, I have all the originals. Oh, you do. And, and yeah. so you, you maintain the copyright. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, that's really, really. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It feels kind of a, like a magical arrangement. That yeah. I have such, uh, creative freedom with that. Yeah. So tell, tell us about this because not only do I love the piece, but I have a feeling like the table that it's sitting on, that is your, your drawing table, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's a, um, well, my, my drawing table, it's like shiny black. And I started seeing spots, you know, because of the glare <laughs> off okay. my drawing table. Right. So I put this big, this huge piece of drawing paper over it. Oh. Um, and then over the years, it just gets ink splattered and color tests and Gosh. different layers of things. Uh, so I, I really love it. It feel, feels kind of archaeological, like it's this accumulation of I mean, history. yeah, you could easily frame that. <laughs> 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 Okay, so this one, Woodcut Art for ESP Theme Show. This is in a show. Yeah, yeah. This is an example of my what I do for galleries. Um, quite a number of years ago, I started working on wood. Because um, I, for, for a long time, I would be, you know, hunting for frames and framing stuff. And I just really disliked doing that yeah. and having to ship stuff that's glass, you know. Right. So, um so I got a scroll saw and started cutting out shapes from wood. Um, and then I would, I, I glue down uh, a layer of Bristol board and press it under bricks. Uh-huh. So that I have basically a 
drawing surface on whatever shape I want. Um, sure. And I really like the idea of drawings as solid objects that can be put anywhere. Um, sure. And yeah, that's what. Yeah, go ahead. What's that? Sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, you go ahead first. Oh, it's okay. Um, uh, what was I saying? That um, so th this one, this is a cut out piece of wood that went to a um, gallery in uh, in Alexandria, uh, Virginia. Um, uh, and I, yeah, I, I really enjoyed working on this one. Um, I, I do a lot of, uh, I send stuff to a lot of group shows where I'll just do a single piece and send it off to a gallery in some place or another. Um, and this one, especially, I got excited about the theme. So right. I kind of think of uh, the artistic process as sort of like a extra sensory perception. Yeah. Um, I really love the, the kind of psychonaut sort of element of drawing. Um, I really started, I, I started off only doing like automatic drawing. Like I would just sit and let my hand move the way it wanted to. And it sort of felt like it lit up parts of my brain or like helped me think more clearly or on my own kind of terms. Mm -hmm. um, so this was me just trying to kind of dig into that and sort of depict sort of the different layers of reality and my own imagination or uh, kind of explore that sense of sort of a multi-layered world um, that making art kind of helps me feel like I can get a glimpse of. Yeah, it's just, I mean, to me, these, your work is such an incredible, um, it, it reinforces all that like human imagination can be. It, it's just, it's totally you. You have a very strong aesthetic that, you know, like you look at your body of work and it's just consistently you. And because of that, you know, when you start to look at all the different types of subject matter you have, it's incredible insight into like the way your mind works. And I just find it to be really like you go on this journey of Theo's mind and you never know where you're going to go, but it's everything about it, the pattern, the colors and extraordinary um, imagination. It makes me wonder like, what do you, you know, the things you read must be um, feeding into this never ending resource of amazing, you know, compositions and things that you tend to put into your paintings and, and your drawings and things like that. And, oh, here's a question. So you talked about bristle board. Are you using like a two ply? Do you draw first and then cut the wood or do you cut the wood first and then, you know, put the, um, the, the blank paper on it and then draw? Like what's your process? I usually I cut out the wood first. Wow. Yeah, because um, uh, I mean, I, I've done it where I, I draw something first, um, but it's hard to be completely accurate with a scroll saw. Yeah. So usually if I, you know, I'll, I'll take a big piece of wood and I'll, I'll draw out shapes that seem like they'd be satisfying to draw in. Like, I, I mean, I had a loose idea. Like, I knew I wanted it to be kind of layers inside of someone's head and <laughs> that there would be kind of an eye beam. <laughs> but beyond that, I didn't know what it was going to be beyond right. the, you know, knowing okay. what the theme was. So I, so I just cut out that shape and then I worked with that. Um, so when yeah, I cut out the wood first, I get to, I, I can make use of whatever weird thing happened while I was cutting it out. You know? I, that's what, that's what I was thinking. Cause like, you, you know, this is just a, a basic head, but then you, you would have had to think about cutting this piece out, mm -hmm. which would seem very strange <laughs> before you <drawn> it, <laughs> and you did utilize that. That's very cool. Okay, I think I lost my laser here. Okay, let's go down to, okay, now what are we looking at here? Another cover art. Yeah, this is a, um, another, I mean, I, I uh, when I first started really getting into drawing all the time, I, I, I was really excited about like underground publishing and zines um, and uh, making books as a form of art. Um, and I still love, I love contributing to like underground publications or uh, like art comics anthologies and stuff like that. And this, this was a, um, a underground uh, small press publication that I, I did a cover for pretty recently uh, called Told to Tell, which is like a, it's like an anthology of art and comics. Um, and I think there were only like 200 copies made. 
Oh. But it's like this really nicely produced book. And I have a, I have a few pages inside too. But I, And that's uh, the guy who published it bought the original. And so the cover is actually the framed original on his wall. And it's a photo of that. So that's like the frame around it. I see. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I just love the, the world of, uh, you know, self-publishing and mm. how um, just un unfettered the creativity can be in that whole realm. So I love yeah. contributing to stuff like that. Sure, sure. It's a great, great thing. Um, and that's just kind of an example of some of my pen and ink art. Um, that one, there, there's a um, this uh, company called Tiny Showcase that um, one, they, they release an archival print once a week by a different artist. Mm -hmm. um, and they asked me to do one. So this is what I drew for them. Um, I don't know. I, I guess it's kind of an example of some of my, my interests of... Uh, um, depicting like a tender moment between potentially scary, <laughs> scary creatures. <laughs> well, and your patterns, like, as I look at them, I, part of my, my cultural background, I guess, is um, Japanese kimono patterns. And I, I can't help but sort of feel like when I look at this here and, and even some of these patterns here, like, where do you get your inspiration for your patterns? Yeah, probably a lot of it's just automatic drawing. Um, like I, there's something just relaxing about drawing patterns. Right. Um, I mean, I, like I could just draw like wood floor, wood floor grain or grass, like all day long. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I'll just get into these modes where I just, a pattern seems satisfying. And I, I mean, I, I don't know how to be minimal with my work. I, I feel like I have to touch every, every square inch of it and sure. fill it with some kind of pattern for it to feel right <laughs> to me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then you must, yeah. after all this time have come up with like your very favorite tools to draw with, because that's one thing I've been experimenting with a lot. Like when you really love line, the quality of line really matters and, you know, being able to get different thicknesses and, uh, ink that is waterproof versus not waterproof or whatever. I mean, is your, is your ink waterproof? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I only use like a, like waterproof India ink. Uh, and I use, uh, I use a technical pen called a repetitograph. Right. It's just a, yeah, that's pretty, I, I mean, I used to use lots of different things and then over the years I've so, slowly whittled it down to kind of the bare minimum in a lot of ways. The rapidographs come in like really tiny, tiny sizes, don't they? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I used to um, always have at least three, like the tiniest one, and then kind of a middle one and a thicker one. Right. Um, but I was always breaking the smallest one, and the, <laughs> and the thicker one would leak, would leak more. And now oh. I pretty much only have one, <laughs> one rapidograph oh. I use. Is that right? And then, okay, so you, you talk about India ink. Is that applied with, like, what kind of tool do you use the India? Like, how do you apply the India ink or are you using colored India ink? Um, just with the, the technical pen. That's what I fill my repetograph with. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's beautiful. And then for the colors, I use a lot of, uh, like, those brush tip uh, Copic right. markers. Right. Uh, and I also use color pencil a lot. Very cool. Yeah. Um, oh, I just uh, yeah. And I use a, I use a little bit of paint sometimes, but not not that often really with my illustration work. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is your uh, yeah. This is where I saw yeah, your. A, I love the close up of the. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of doodles all over it of yeah. like like if I have to talk on the phone or something I'll yeah end up drawing on my <laughs> directly oh. on my drawing table, but you can see all the spilled stuff and right marks everywhere like how many years of work is on this right here <laughs> I, was, I wish I was better at keeping track I, I have my old one over here too that that's not quite as layered and I think this one has been on my table longer than any other one oh, that's, that's really probably cool. been on there for yeah maybe seven or eight years at this point yeah I remember when like just being in art school and you know how the tables get layers and layers and layers of you know years and years of students and I just remember taking photos of the tables because they were so fascinating but uh yeah. 
yeah, yeah. I love it. yeah. Uh, Tell us about your uh, studio corner. Yeah, which is kind of behind me right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that this particular corner is kind of my, uh, I don't know, like my reminder to be confident or to keep going because yeah. it's all like the that whole row of books is all uh, stuff I've either um, oh. been in or wow had published myself. Wonderful. So it's just kind of like stuff I've contributed to to over the years, and then the posters in the back are just uh, different illustration jobs or posters yeah. from like a book release event or a you know museum show I had once, stuff like that. Right. right. So just, it's nice to keep all that and kind of yeah. remind myself that I've, this is an you know I, I'm at a point where I've done a lot and accumulated a lot of work, and I just want to keep pushing forward and not be stagnant. Yeah. Right, right. And and there's a recent article about you and your work. And that was in when when did that run again, in case people oh, want to look that up? Oh, the one in the Missoulian? Yeah. That, um, that was, uh, I guess, the end of September. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. That's really great. Did they come to your studio and, and chat with you and take photos of your work? And they did. Yeah. Yeah. And that was that was specifically for the, the graphic novel that was published about a month ago. Right. I think yeah. you gave me an image of that, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, there it is. The segue. <laughs> <laughs> I also love how you photographed it against, you know, like colors. <laughs> just the Oh, yeah. Colors. So tell <laughs> us about the book. That's pretty amazing. What an accomplishment. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. I, I, I really had a lot of fun doing that. I um, Being able to tell stories with my art, I, I feel like is uh, this whole other level and it's, it's a lot more challenging but incredibly rewarding right um, and this one this is a 184 page graphic novel yeah. uh, that's all uh, it's an adaptation of a short story by Jeff Vandermeer who's a, a sci-fi and speculative fiction author huh. um, and we kind of struck up a friendship a number of years ago yeah. um, when he, he found some of my work um, and ended up commissioning me to do a number of, of pieces. Right. Um, and then over time, it, the idea of doing this uh, book came up and he, he basically just sent me one of his short stories and I uh, went through it all and figured out how to adapt it to a graphic novel. Do you envision like this becoming like a series where you could do a whole lot of books together? Um, maybe. I mean, it he, he was really, he's, he's really fun to work with in that yeah. way. Um, I, I mean, I would love to, um, I mean, I, I write my own comics too. And I've, I've been working on a, a longer piece that's uh, it's about 200 pages long now. Oh, nice. That's just me. And that, that kind of delves into a lot of the themes of my art of kind of, uh, you know, trying to interact and explore my imagination and unlock things in my own head, that kind of stuff. But um, I was hitting a lot of it, it. It was really complicated. Like that that story's been. I, I was hitting a lot of walls with it. Um, and then when this idea came up, I, I felt like it was a chance to really dive in and into the um, the mechanics of comics and right. what I can do with that. Um, so I, I really feel felt like it pushed me forward and took me to a new place with my work. Um, and now I've been back at working on my own book again. Oh, good for you. That is what a great goal to have. And this one was published, was not self-published. It was published by uh, Drawn and Quarterly Montreal. So what was that like working with a, a publisher? Oh, it's, it's great. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're, they're one of my favorite publishers in the world too. So it, oh. it was incredibly exciting to be working with them. Um, and I've been, I've been published by other uh, small presses. Some of my own stuff came out from uh, Secret Acres was kind of the original publisher to um, put out my work in the past. Okay. Um, but this is the this is the largest publisher I've worked with. Wow. Uh, and they've been really wonderful. Yeah, that's great. You had a very positive experience. Okay, I don't yeah. know. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. This one. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's <laughs> sort of another <laughs> another side of my work is it's kind of a um, a family tradition um, right. where uh, I built this it's 
eight feet tall. It's like this eight foot tall uh, person shaped frame that every fall I, I bring that out into the yard and stake it into the ground. And uh, my uh, my mother in law has a huge garden. Like her her uh, um, yard is almost like a miniature farm. Wow. Uh, we and we help her with that every year. Um, okay. the, the tradition kind of became that when uh, she's putting the garden to, to bed. I take all the extra stuff from the garden and um, we have friends and family get together and we all build this monster together in the yard out of all the, all the yard waste. Yeah. And then uh, I, I like to chronicle kind of what happens with it because deer will come into our yard and, and uh-huh. be eating it or, and, or squirrels <laughs> will climb right inside of it and be you know, gathering sunflower seeds um, or like birds will burst out of its chest when I leave the house. (laughs) It's it's just kind of this fun. uh, It's become this family tradition. This was the sixth year I've done it. So this Uh is this year's. I'm just curious what the frame looks like. Is it made of metal or wood or what is it? Um, It's just a wooden frame. It's just like one by one Uh wood. So it's it's pretty... uh, it's pretty rickety at this point from getting rained on for so many years. Uh, and then the eyes are, are, I did it exactly how I do my, my woodcuts for galleries. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, it just seems so much like your, your creatures. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's very cool. Well, um, thank you so much. I don't know if, I think that might've been the last slide and, you know, I, my work is so different from yours and I, um, <laughs> If you have any questions, let me know, because I'm just kind of walking through kind of my history a little bit. And just uh, Mm. unlike you, I'd say um, trying to figure out my personal voice was a huge deal. Like it it just wasn't like, I don't know, yours seems to be so cohesive and everything. But for me, I think my voice is continually changing over time. And I, I look back on it and I just see at least in my situation, personal voice, um, uh, it had to evolve like based on my understanding of what art even was, because I, I didn't have a whole lot of encouragement in art, like so many artists, you know, so, uh, it, it was just kind of going from art that was pretty to art that actually had meaning to me. And that is such a like huge distance between those two things that you try to do. I was mostly self-taught for, you know, decades. And after we had our first son in 1986, we moved to Montana. I was born in Wisconsin, but then uh, my husband was uh, born in New Hampshire. But anyways, we lived in London for a year, then moved to North Carolina where our first son was born. And then we moved to Montana. This is 1986 when we just arrived in Montana. And I had a little kitchen nook. Uh, I had no formal training. Maybe I'd taken one art, one watercolor workshop at this point, although I did take a lot of adult art classes in London. And I remember walking through a lot of dark tunnels at night by myself. (laughs) It's like, I never thought once about it not being safe, you know, but that was back in the 1980s. So anyways, uh, this is one of the very first paintings I did in watercolor. I remember I was in the kitchen and had nice fluorescent lighting and um, I knew nothing about watercolor, but I really wanted to study edges. So this one was um, trying to just grasp the technique of watercolor. And I also didn't understand anything really about color and design. So everything was really very just intuitive. And I remember I had a photo of um, some leaves and that's basically what inspired me to do this. And I found watercolor to be one of the most difficult mediums looking back now. Um, It's simple in terms of you just need water and a brush and your paint, but (laughs) what you don't have in complexity of the medium itself, you know, I think anyways, I don't know if you've done watercolor, you probably have, but I think, yeah, yeah, that whole thing about the paper buckling and like how wet is the paper, how much water's on it. And, you know, (laughs) Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I did watercolor for about, I'd say 10 years, all the time being a a full-time mom and just doing art when I could. Didn't, it was definitely like I was a hobbyist, but I did, you know, art fairs and things like that and got into some galleries and and sold work and stuff like that. But I wasn't, you know, I certainly was not um, a full-time artist, I was a full-time mom and that was my focus. And then basically what happened in my watercolor years was I 
I did work very hard for 10 years. And then the next I plateaued because all my work was focused on pretty work, like just pretty and landscapes. And, but there was no real content that I could be inspired by. And I think I just hit this wall, like, well, I am really tired of painting florals. I just don't want to do another floral. So I stopped painting and I didn't paint for 10 years. And I did go back to school after this 10 year drought and figured that I just wanted to understand what it was that was missing. Like, why did I have this drought? And what am I missing? What I learned from grad school, I think, was that what I was missing was the actual content of my life. And that's the one thing that I will always say grad school did for me. I didn't go there for any other reason than to try and figure out what these missing links were. But what happened was I very luckily, I I grasped a topic that aligned with my life experience, which when I was in college, um, I was pursuing a a biochemistry degree and it nearly killed me in the end. And when I came out of that, I, I got my degree, but I couldn't use it. I had like a PTSD experience and I had tremendous amount of depression and anxiety that I didn't even understand how it happened, how this all happened or, you know, anything. I couldn't put the pieces together. So by the time I got to the grad program, what I latched onto for my thesis was the amount of fear I had felt for decades. Uh, The only thing, the only metaphor I could think of was terrorism. Terrorism was my metaphor for how I was living my life. And after that period of time, I started to really dive into color and design in a way that uh, was kind of like applying the science of art, which since I am an instructor now, I wholeheartedly believe in getting that foundation very strong. Uh, If you can, it's very hard because even if you go to art school, which I did, it's not like I I never got my BS in, in, in art or BA where I would have maybe learned that, but I didn't have that. Getting back to, I guess, the acrylic and mixed media period was when I started to play with pattern more and I loved to, I loved shape and I love mark making and color was something I was trying to understand. And then, you know, that was acrylic and mixed media. And then I, in around 2016 or so, I took a workshop in oil and cold wax medium. And again, I didn't know anything about the medium, but I sort of felt like I knew the things I was wanting in my work, which were the the shapes that were really unusual and, and sophisticated color. And of course, mark making. So line is starting to become like, I'm finally realizing it's 2016 now and I've been painting for decades. And I'm only now realizing how important line is to me in painting. And then we, um, we lost our home in 2016 and I had four studios. I had um, two sides of our garage. So there was no car in the garage. I had taken over that. And then I had taken over a bedroom and a living room. So I had four areas for my four different mediums. And then in, uh, in 2016, on July 31st, um, the Roaring Lion Fire came through and our, our home uh, was the second one to go. And we had 45 minutes to grab everything. So I essentially, you know, I, I don't, um, my family all helped to grab artwork, but <laughs> not much else. And I guess looking back on that, I was preparing for this museum solo show at the Holter Museum. And I was like three quarters of the way there. And I had a a full color catalog that I had been working toward, but then the deadline was just weeks away. And then the fire came. So anyways, I was to to rent a space, but this piece is the first piece I did after the fire. And I felt like, I think one of the reasons mark making is so important to me is because it is so basic and it's just so raw. It kind of distills down to the bare minimum. Like I didn't have any supplies. All I had, and I think I did a lot of this with the ashes from our fire. You can make do with whatever you have. You don't need to have anything fancy. And there were so many mixed emotions after the fire. I have to say there are a lot of positive things that happened after the fire looking back, because when you're brought back to like the bare minimum of everything, life becomes so much simpler. Like we, we, uh, you know, in our case, like, you know, the accumulation of stuff being married and having two children and all the things we lost, like, I didn't miss any of that. I didn't care about any of that. You know, I mean, sure. The sentimental things, but 99.9% of it was like, wow, that actually felt pretty good. <laughs> and to get rid of all that stuff. The fire was actually, again, being a, a part of life and 
it definitely informed the work I was doing, which I had to create a quarter of the show that was going to be the solo show. And everything I did for that final quarter of the content was pretty much related to the fire because I didn't have any supplies. And it was kind of like, well, I can get some hot plates and I can create some wax. The palette became very simple and monochromatic simply because I didn't have a lot of color and I didn't want to use a lot of color because that's not my state of mind at that time. And then this is done with wax on paper and just flicking the brush around. It was actually a silicone brush. I just liked this egg shape. And then this is further along. Um, Actually, it's probably a little bit later than 2016, but I had string and I just did wax and I just plopped it on the hot plate. And then I pulled on the string in various ways and it made these wonderful marks. And then you just put a piece of rice paper on top and that's, that's it. You know, you get a one-time thing. Yeah, this is part of my Holter show. Um, this painting was started in the, uh, the house that burned down. And I remember... You know, not to, I, like I work with no, nothing in my mind, like you do, like it's, it's all from the mind, which I feel is the greatest resource of all, because there are no limitations. It's all like trying to allow your subconscious and everything you've essentially digested in a lifetime of information from books and everything we see in our life. It's all in there, but we have to pull it out. So um, I really got stuck because the painting that we we grabbed from the burning house or the house that was about to burn down had literally nothing on it. It, it didn't, you know, it's a very early stage and it sat in the new, new space where I'm renting now with nothing on it. And I just kind of lacked all inspiration to work on it in any way. And it just sat there and sat there and sat there. And, and I even like put all white paint over the entire thing. And then a friend of mine from Canada came to visit and we were painting together in the studio and she had leftover paint and she's like, oh, I have to go now. And, you know, she was leaving the next day. So she had these piles of paint and I said, Oh, okay, well, I'll take it. And <laughs> I threw it onto this painting and that's essentially what happened. It just kind of happened pretty quickly by the time I had her paint. So um, just other work, this is like cold wax and oil, one of the mediums I work in, but it's kind of like at this point in my career, I would say that I must have shapes that are very unusual. Uh, they're often made with either handmade tools or just, I'm always seeking shapes that I, I find to be really interesting. They're usually not from the natural world. It's everything for me that's happened makes me feel almost like I'm trying to figure out where I fit in. And the only way to do that is to like pull from within and my marks and, and the color is usually quite blended and mixed. And I don't usually go for a ton of high saturation. I like these muted grays and things that just, you mix them and mix them. And I also like you, I love pattern and the circle continues to be something I keep coming back to. And I, I feel culturally that when I was looking at a book of kimono patterns, that dots and stripes are the underlying patterns that you find in a lot of these kimonos, which I found really fascinating because I, I absolutely love stripes and dots and I don't, I don't know why that would be unless it's just in my DNA, which I accept, mm -hmm. right? That's probably likely the case. And then this is the uh, series of work that I started a membership group. It's called Art and Success Pro. And as I'm creating these master classes, I, I was just explained to my sister this morning how much to my surprise, I wasn't expecting that I myself would learn and grow so much from the content that I'm trying to provide for others. But it just goes to show that I don't think we ever stop learning and growing. And I'm a perpetual learner. I don't ever feel like I've gotten anywhere. I always feel like I'm a beginner. And I love that I don't want to get bored. And so but these, um, unlike all my other work, focus on mark making, which happened to be one of our master classes. And it wasn't about color. It wasn't about really anything except for my love of mark. So I kind of took everything away, except of course there's shape as well. But I mean, it's it's definitely distilled down to a much more clearer voice. And I felt really comfortable with it. It was kind of effortless. And I hadn't really experienced that in art before. But do you have any questions or? Um, yeah, do you, um, I was curious about um, like during the, the period of time where you're feeling so much anxiety, mm -hmm. um, do you feel like the art is what, 
kind of helped you move through that or past that? Did you, do you feel like you worked it out in your art? Yeah. I mean, to this day, one of my, you know, when I, I teach and uh, go places and I, in my artist talk, I always talk about the connection between my healing because I, at the time, after I had like this traumatic event, you know, right at the point where I was about to graduate and I didn't understand what had happened and I was full of anxiety and so we ended up in London. I started to take these art courses and I also at the simultaneously tried to get help for like trying to figure out and get a diagnosis for what it was that had happened to me because at that time nobody was talking about PTSD. I, I had no idea what that was. All I knew was that whoever I was on one day, the next day, I was gone. Um, and I, I didn't understand it. And I'd always been like this overachiever and never had troubles accomplishing anything I wanted to do. It was like, I, you know, it was music or academics or whatever. And that's all of a sudden I'm like, um, this empty shell, I couldn't do anything. So ironically, after this whole PTSD thing happened, and essentially having everything I could have done taken away. I couldn't even play the piano anymore. I had too much anxiety and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't certainly couldn't work in the field of science. It was like, well, the only thing left I can do <laughs> is my artwork. And it was almost like it was meant to be. So that's why I, I wouldn't take back anything that happened because I think in the end, we end up doing what perhaps we are meant to do. And if we go on kind of a circuitous pathway to get there, so be it. Um, I don't, I look at those years of struggling and fear and anxiety as, wow, that's incredible content to be able to hold and express in your artwork. And it also made me tremendously empathetic. I think when it comes to like being an instructor or being an artist, holding on to empathy to me is, is something that I, I love about life and feeling empathy, because for me, it's like this, um, incredible way to connect with artwork and the sensitivity of line. It's kind of like that sensitivity that we need as artists to be vulnerable, to create art that's honest and filled with integrity, I guess. Um, because as artists, we constantly make choices about what we want to do. We can do a lot of things, but that doesn't mean we should do a lot of things. We have so many choices. Like you could do a number of things with your art and your talent, but you are being true to your voice. And I think that as I was using my art to heal, because there, for the longest time, there was no medication for decades. Yeah. My art was definitely my therapy. Yeah. It's definitely, a, um, I don't know. It, it feels cathartic when I look at it, like it feels like, you know, like each piece feels like something that's happened, you know, internally as well as externally, you know, like yeah. I feel like proof, like each one is like proof of an inward experience of some kind. Is, is your, your studios in your, in your house? Here's a quick tour of my studio, Theo. I have more control of my cell phone than I do of my uh, laptop. So I have like 3,000 square feet and I'm renting the Rocky Mountain Grange in Hamilton. This is my area where I do all of my encaustic, which is the messiest of all the mediums that I work in. I've got cardboard on my floor to uh, protect the precious asbestos tiles underneath the cardboard. But anyways, I this these are my tools, my hot plates and frying pans and all the things that I need to do my encaustic work. This is how I store my paints and I've just cleaned up this area because I was um, assembling some work here. Got more work on the walls and I do create a lot of videos so I have a lot of camera equipment here for filming both for my online courses uh, as well as my YouTube channel and so everything looks pretty um, pretty messy actually no even after I've cleaned it. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, your, your studio is so, so different from mine. Mine is tiny. I'm in the Brunswick building. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. And how long have you been there? Um, quite a few years now. Yeah, when I, we, we moved back to Missoula uh, from Portland. Um, okay. Like uh, nine years ago now. Yeah. Um, and I got a, a 
tiny space here then. Uh, and then I, I was in the warehouse mall for a while uh-huh. and then came back here, I guess, like four years ago. Uh-huh. Oh, cool. Yeah. So you rent, yeah. you rent your studio there at the Brunswick? I do. Yeah. Okay, yeah. nice. I want to grab the piece I have of yours. Hang on a second, I forgot. So oh, cool. I wanted to show you that. <laughs> I love what you wrote on the back of it too. So this is my little Theo. <laughs> oh, <cool. laughs> I love what it says on the back. It says mental clarity spirit. So do you write do you write something on the back of all your pieces? I do, yeah. Yeah. That is so cool. And I guess that kind of hints at the sort of uh cathartic quality of mine too where I always feel like I'm drawing to kind of try to get clarity in my own head you know yeah, yeah aren't we all <laughs> so, well, I can show you the um yeah I just finished a new a new piece for radius and I'm going to be delivering this kind of a, a little bit larger for me oh for my the goodness uh, is that yeah because do you normally you normally don't work that large or um and I mean this isn't even large <laughs> but yeah oh. I mean I put I put so at least for for me, this is huge. This is like yeah. a larger piece, but yeah. Um, yeah, I just spend so much time doing the tiny details that, like, you know, doing doing like the twelve by twelve uh, album art to me, that's gigantic, and they take yeah. me significantly longer than anything else. But yeah, this is <laughs> kind of is a big chunk of wood that I did it on. Um, is that cradled or is that solid? Uh, it's solid. It yeah, is this solid. is like a solid chunk of wood. <laughs> yeah. That's uh-huh. fabulous. Well, considering you put so much detail, I mean, that is large to me, what you just held up. I mean, that that's enormous because of all the time it takes for you to do that. So yeah. Yeah. Sure. Well, thank you, Theo. Thank you so much. I wish you all the luck with your work and album covers uh, yeah. and books and radius gallery. And it's so nice to get a chance to chat with you. Yeah, you too. Thanks for inviting me to talk. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's keep in touch. And uh, yeah, sounds good. Hope to see you in person sometime. I know. <laughs> maybe, right. maybe at the gallery. But. Yeah, I hope so too. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, <laughs> bye bye. Take care. You too. Bye.